Hello everybody, Ninjaville you here with the first official question and answer video, given that I recorded the one about Shark Bite 3 before I actually announced this was going to be a thing. For those of you who don't know, I've decided to weekly write a video answering your questions, so that even if I'm not able to record a video, when I'm next able, I will have lots of scripts ready to record for you guys. So if you have a question you want me to make a video on, post it below and I will pick the best from this video for next week's. So with that, on to the question for this week's video. In fact, I received two very similar questions this week, both of which were worth addressing. So this week's question was posted by TDMJ4, although Julian Mercante, I hope I pronounced that right, posted a similar question a little while later. And TDMJ4's question was as follows. Do you think that the new servers that are being remade will end up having the full game? Also, do you think that they will try to find a way to add more custom stuff into the game if it's completed again? So my initial reaction to the first question was, it was obvious, like who really expects the developers to randomly decide to release an unfinished game. It's not like they're under any time pressure, we've awaited this long, we're under no illusion it's going to be soon, so why would they release an incomplete game? They've already shown they're fully capable of all the programming that they would need. That was my initial reaction, but as I thought about it, I realised this wasn't right. The devs aren't going to release an unfinished game because they're scared of not meeting a deadline we're pressuring them into, or because they're unable, but that's not to say there aren't any other reasons they might release an unfinished game. And as it turns out, there's actually a really good reason that the LEGO universe we get will probably be, and probably always remain, unfinished. And this is property behaviours. For those of you who don't know or remember what I'm going on about, property behaviours were a feature in Live where users were able to add behaviours, as they were called, to models on their property. These behaviours amounted to basic scripting with various triggers such as speech or a model being attacked, being linked to result in a particular effect, such as a model moving or smashing. Now, why am I singling out property behaviours to discuss? Sure, this sounds reasonably complicated to implement, so you're creating a miniature scripting language inside your game, but something being hard to implement hasn't stopped developers performing some truly amazing feats in the past, so why is this different? Well, the answer is nothing technical, as it turns out. Instead, it comes down to a semi-legal line we need to tread as a community. We are in a position where pretty much everything that goes into programming a server breaks the terms and conditions laid down by LEGO, meaning that they have a perfect legal right to take action against us at any moment in time. The reason we still exist is the fact that the community has had contact with LEGO, and we've agreed to maintain the same standards they try to keep in life. Primarily, this comes down to remaining a child-friendly community. What are the requirements for this? Well, no one expects anyone, be it us or LEGO, to be perfect, but we need to be in a position where no one could reasonably criticise how the servers are run. Why is this the case? Well, take a look at Roblox if you can bring yourself to. If you look online, you'll find a plethora of articles by various news sites discussing the experiences of a parent distraught to find their child being asked for personal information, or being asked if they wanted a girlfriend or boyfriend by a random player on Roblox. Roblox doesn't have much of a brand to protect outside of their website and their game, so this isn't really too much of a problem for them. If they lose the game, at least they're not losing anything else. For LEGO, however, this was a much greater problem. Whereas in the case of Roblox, the state of their game would only reflect on the profits of the game, for LEGO, the game they were running, just as a first attempt at building up a large online game, this could affect their brand image as a whole if anything like this occurred. Something they wanted to avoid at all costs. Literally at all costs. The game shut down because of money. One of the greatest money sinks in LU was the cost of moderation. The fact that every property had to be moderated before going public if they wished to avoid the risk of bad press. This turned out not to be enough, however, as it became clear that people would go to increasingly complicated lengths to hide inappropriate content in their properties, utilising behaviours so that the static appearance of the property as the moderators saw it in screenshots could be altered at will. In other words, property behaviours presented a huge risk which Lego had to face, and which we too now have to. The risk is that a child sees inappropriate content, goes to a reporter, and the reporter publishes an article describing how Lego let a group of young adults set up a server for children to play on containing inappropriate content, and how Lego have been been reckless in allowing us to do that. The only course of action LEGO would have to save face would be to completely disown us, to say, you know what, you're right, we should take down notices to all the servers now, and that would be the end of everything. Since they don't really care if we succeed or otherwise, they would be completely happy to disown us on a whim, and since they have legal rights on their side, there will be literally nothing we could legally do against it. So that is why, even if a server implements behaviours, such as I believe Obcrooks are still planning on doing, they won't be likely to use behaviours on public servers. But that's not the only issue now that both TLU and OpCrux plan on releasing their code publicly on completion, as in theory anyone could now set up a server and just 
check the box in the code to turn behaviors on. At the moment, this is a risk, but it's not as huge as it seems. DLU has the largest store of knowledge available on the game anywhere, so when it comes to it, theirs will likely be the server getting the new content and holding most of the player base. People may choose to set up their own servers with build behaviors enabled, but these will likely be small and won't attract children as much as they will experienced builders, hugely, hugely minimizing the risk. So I guess that's the answer. Even if it isn't the code, the main servers will be unlikely to implement property behaviors, and so won't technically have the full game. Other servers may add them, but it's less likely. Aside from this, I think it's pretty likely we're going to get the whole game. Like Obviously, there aren't going to be things such as your access to the LEGO Club place being linked to your LEGO Club account, but that's a small thing. Aside from property behaviors, I'd say pretty much everything you would associate with being fundamentally LEGO Universe will be in the game. The next part of the question was about custom stuff, and at the risk of plugging Dayla 99 Productions again, which, you know, I just did, there are already videos of custom stuff in an official DLU testing phase. If you haven't seen this, I genuinely would recommend his channel. I've discussed this in my video on winter testing, but I don't actually have any footage in that winter testing video, I don't think. So take a look at Dayla 99 Productions. He does videos on all of the testing, and he's been here since Crash Test, I think. Something like that. Specifically, the winter testing event, where CDM Pants and Neil, two members of DLU's team, both put together new maps for the tests. These maps were made primarily in Happy Flower, the original world editor used by the LUPs, which I think stands for LEGO Universe Partners. But the technical processes which went into them were huge. In the case of CDM Pants map, baking lighting, creating new physics files, adding them to the client database, to the world maps, then pushing all of these to the clients, in the largest example of client modding to date. Currently, the technology exists to add new items to the game, new worlds, new missions, as well as creating new skills, as long as the skill you want to create can be made by combining multiple components that went into existing skills. In fact, the deal you currently have a channel in the tester discord for future content suggestions, and CDM Pants has been creating new faction gear designs based off existing concept art. So yeah, with all of the tools now available to developers, I think it's pretty safe to say that LEGO Universe certainly can look forward to seeing more new content in the years to come than it already has seen. But there's something else to consider here, which is who's going to be implementing the content. In particular, I know that Darwin, someone who's been working on LEGO Universe for years, he's reached the stage where he really just wants to be done with this. It, brilliant, it sort of just a, will be a weight off his back to finally finish. And so whilst in theory we could be getting new content added, it's going to be up to the developers to see if they really want to sink more years of their life into this. But I know that I for one am definitely looking forward to seeing the existing gameplay of LU expanding to hopefully become even more interesting and enjoyable than it already is. And even if the existing developers may not all choose to work on it, I'm sure there will be people who continue to add new content, and with the software we have available, this should be possible. So, for the record, the tools that are currently available to DLU are as follows. Client packing and unpacking. The game is about 10 gigabytes by default, but when it shipped, it was around 3 gigabytes because of the use of packed files, which both speed up the game at runtime and reduce the file size. DLU's client is packed by default to reduce people modding their own clients, and so client packing and unpacking is necessary to add new files to the game. Database editing. They have complete access to the database files which store all the information the game uses to understand all of the files they've just added in the packed client. Adding new items was a limitation to open source projects for ages until Winston published an FDB editor in his Infected Rose library a while back. I posted a video on it at the time. And DLU does have this ability along with Rob Crooks. This means almost any new content can in theory be added as long as you can make the relevant files or something doesn't need to be hard coded. In terms of getting the relevant files, there is world editing editing, mesh editing for renders and fit the physics engine. Currently, DLU has the ability to interact with LU's file types covering all of these areas, so the most things you can think of, aside from really complicated things like creating totally original custom skills which would require hard coding into the game, can be added. And with that, I hope this answers your question, TDMJ4. Thank you all very much for listening, I hope you enjoyed this. Remember to throw any questions you have in the comments, to subscribe to the developer channels which are in the description, as always, they're the ones who make all of this possible. With that, I've been Ninja Value, and I will see you around.